Right, welcome back to another episode of the GCN Tech Clinic where I try and solve your bike related problems. So if you've got one, leave it for me down there in the comment section below or alternatively on all forms of social media using the hashtag AskGCNTech. Right, let's crack on with the first question this week. It comes in from Javier who says, Hi John, I have an old Suntour VX rear derailleur uh, that I'd like to refurbish for a vintage build but the jockey wheels are shot and I can't find them anywhere. Uh, what jockey wheels would be a good replacement or upgrade for it? Cheers from Guatemala. Blimey, I think it's the first question we've ever had in from Guatemala. Right, Javier, very good question. And there's a few variants around that VX rear derailleur. And they're quite old, um, but what I'd try and go for probably is some of the Shimano um, jockey wheels. So the, the entry level ones that come with little metal covers over a bushing that goes in there rather than a bearing because they tend to have, have just a little bit more uh, movement on them. So it's gonna help slightly with that older style uh, rear derailleur there. Alternatively, maybe have a look around from Tax because Tax, the Dutch company, actually makes some pulley wheels that come with different shims on them which fit a variety of different rear derailleurs. So have a look for that. I think, from memory, the VX rear derailleurs, this is a really cloudy part of my mind, they came with 10 teeth on the jockey wheel. So make sure you get them with 10 teeth because obviously you do need the chain to be able to go around inside of the cage. So uh, that's gonna be your first port of call really. And well, good luck with it. I do like a bit of a retro build. Right, next up we've got a question from Alex Juarez who says, uh, are there any good aluminum aero but affordable track bike frames that I could find? Most of the vendors that I found are a little suspicious. Uh, also, what would I need for a full first time build? Right, Alex, there sure are some really great aluminium aero track frames out there. Uh, the first one is the TC1 from Terry Dolan, very good mate of mine, so certainly check out his website for those frames. I've actually got one of the first generations of those, still going nice and strong, so you've got it on my word. As for what else you're gonna need, well, you're gonna need a bottom bracket, a chain set, wheels, bar, stem, seat post, saddle, uh, everything. So go on the website and have a look. Normally, I'm pretty sure on Terry's website, you can actually spec out the bike as you go, so choosing all the different components. Uh, that's just the first one that springs to mind, so go ahead from there. Okay, next up is Gabriel Sarazin Mackay, who says, hey John, great show again and again. Thank you, checks in the post. Uh, I'm riding a 15 year old BHR Callis Altegra Group set. Everything is slowly but surely falling apart. Uh, I'm getting back on the bike this year, good stuff, and look forward to riding quite a lot. Your episode on cheap bike to superbike got me thinking, my budget being limited, should I save money and purchase a new bike or invest in a new Shimano 105 Group set or the SRAM equivalent? Right, great question this. I guess if you're happy with the frame, the BHR Callis, and it's all okay, and you know, it's perfectly fine, no dodgy welds, nothing like that, dropouts, then yeah, why not keep it if you're happy with it? And you're gonna feel the difference from going from that old Altegra group set I think you said you've got onto that new 105. I'd be tempted to go with that. After all, uh, it's 15 years old. That old Trek that I transformed, that was almost 20 years old, and that, well, that had a really new lease of life on it. Mr. OP and Richardson, they absolutely loved cycling it. So let us know what you do and why not submit before and after photos to the Screw Riding Upgrades by Upgrade section of the tech show if that's your option you decide to go for. Right, next up is Dr. Breeze Air who says, Hi John, thanks for all the help. Is there any way to mount flat mount calipers on post mount frames and forks? Oof, Dr. Breeze, to my knowledge, no, there isn't. If anyone out there does know a way to do that, let me know down there in the comment section. Also, show me a photo of it because I'm really keen to see exactly how that would look and work. Uh, but yeah, I'm stumped on that one, I'm afraid, Dr. Breeze Air. So uh, yeah, can't help you there, I'm afraid. Next up is a question from Callum Hockey, who says, hey John, I'm in the process of building a fixie stroke single speed with a flip-flop hub. Uh, I'm worried about the chain tension. Would I be able to use a 16 tooth sprocket on one side and an 18 tooth on the other without playing around too much with the chain tension? I.e. would a quick changeover be possible and which side should I tension the chain to first? Right Callum, great question there. Uh, what I would do is first of all, do the tension of a chain with the 18 tooth sprocket in position for your drivetrain and have the wheel probably about a centimetre back from the end of the dropout. So when I say the end, I mean the end closest to the bottom bracket. So not where you're going in, rather where it meets the end of the dropout. So the furthest forward bit. Hopefully that's nice and clear. 
go back about a centimeter, put the chain on, try and get it tensioned so that it's uh, at the correct tension around about there. That way, when you push the wheel forward slightly, you can take the chain off and you can then remove the actual rear wheel, flip it around and put the chain back onto the 16 tooth and then it's gonna be further back in the dropout, so closer to where you actually insert it into the rear end, but hopefully it will still be nice and tensioned there without overhanging at the back end of the dropout. Good luck with that one. It's something which, yeah, I've done loads and loads of times on my own track bike, so I know it does work, uh, certainly between a uh, 14 and a 16 tooth sprocket with the same chain ring, that sort of thing, so you'll be okay on that one too. Right, next is Alan Dodds. Now, Alan says, would you have a view on a simple phone that would be best for taking in my pocket out on the bike. Just want something small that will allow me to make calls, upload to Garmin, and maybe even use live track. Loathe to carry my big expensive smartphone if it can be avoided. There's got to be a sweet spot for solo cyclists somewhere. Right then, Alan Dodds. Uh, I used to actually do this myself. I actually destroyed a few different mobile phones, believe it or not, through sweating. It used to get all inside the internals and ruin them until I started covering them in cling film and you know, tended to survive a little bit longer. But have a look around online and you could probably find a pretty good smartphone that will do all those features for under £100, dollars, euros, whatever your currency is. Something nice and affordable there, I reckon, for you to take out on the bike. Bear in mind though, make sure that the uh, SIM tray that you put the SIM card in is nice and easily removable so you can simply swap it from your original phone into the smart, uh, into this second smartphone, uh, meaning that you're more likely to do it because I've done exactly what you suggest there. You know, I wanna keep my posh smartphone for best, but I end up taking it out with me because it was such a hassle to get the SIM card in and out. So something to bear in mind there. Also, the good news is most of those cheaper smartphones tend to be a little bit smaller too and likely more robust, which is good news, quite frankly. Right, Tokyo Cyclist is next. Tokyo Cyclist, regular commenter. So let's see what they've got to ask this week. Hi, John. I am slightly embarrassed asking this question that may have a simple answer. Right, first up, no question is simple, okay? Everyone has to start somewhere, so just putting that out there. So any question is a question in my eyes. Uh, I have a portable air pump that requires screwing on to the top of the Presta valve in order to put air inside it. Every time I finish pumping air, however, the inner rod inside the valve comes off when I unscrew the pump from the valve and air just gushes out. I use pliers to tighten the rod inside the valve, but I'm worried I'm damaging it by doing so. Is this a common problem? What am I doing wrong? Right, okay. Those pumps that screw onto the actual valve itself, when you put your air in, you start to create this really tight vacuum between the adapter of the pump and the inner tube or the valve, whatever it is you're putting the air into. And therefore, unless that valve course of the central bit is done up really tight, they do in fact tend to actually unscrew the valve core when you unscrew the pump from it. It's incredibly frustrating, especially if you've just pumped up a tire and uh, yeah, you know, you're running short of time or something. So some pumps have a tiny little pressure release valve really close to where it screws on. So that just releases that pressure that's built up so you can unscrew it. But even then, sometimes they undo those valve cores. So what you've been doing there with a pair of pliers on the valve is absolutely great. Make sure you don't bend that little fragile bit. Instead, go for the, tend to have a couple of flat sections. Uh, you can even use a multi-purpose spoke key sometimes just to do them up nice and tight. But pay attention, when you're doing them up, hold on to that valve itself, so the valve stem nice and tight, so it's not twisting on the inner tube inside of there or a tubular tire, anything like that, because if you start to twist it, essentially you could work that loose and then, well, you're gonna render everything useless. So hold it nice and tight with your fingers or another pair of pliers. So one pair of pliers for holding the valve stem and then one, or val valve stem, sorry, and then the other one for doing up that valve core inside of it, and you should be okay. Hopefully that's gonna solve the problem because trust me, there is nothing more frustrating than that. In fact, some of the guys I used to race with, if they used to ask to borrow my track pump before a race, I'd quite often lend it to them because then they'd pump up the tire, undo it, and they'd be left with a flat tire minutes before the start of a race. Of course, I would always put the valve core back in because that's what Johnny Tech does. And the penultimate question this week comes in from Nicholas Smith, who says, hi John, love the shows. Very kind of you, Nicholas. Uh, keep up the hard work. Do you have any tips on making sure the wheels are straight in the forks when putting a wheel back inside of it? Uh, I take my bike to work so that I can ride in my lunch hour and have to take the front wheel off so I can put the bike in the boot. When putting the wheel back on, it takes me ages to get the wheel properly aligned without it rubbing on the brakes. Any tips? 
Right, Nicholas, I'm going to assume here that you've got uh, rim brakes and not disc brakes because disc brakes tend to be pretty good with alignment unless, of course, you go ahead and pull one of the brake levers and the uh, pads actually come in a little bit from the pistons. Right, all that out of the way then. So, you've got your bike, taken it out of the car, you're going to go out for your lunchtime ride. First up, let's make sure that brake caliper is nice and tightly fitted into your forks. So, normally you have a little serrated washer that goes in between the brake caliper and the front of the fork and that actually digs slightly into the material, so whether or not you've got carbon or alloy or whatever, it's just gonna prevent that brake from rocking once it's done up nice and snugly. If it's not done up nice and snugly, it is gonna be able to move and everything like that. Second bit of advice I can give you is don't try and put the wheel in when the bike's upside down. The reason being, it's not gonna find its way into the dropout quite as perfectly as if it's around the correct way. So if you've got the wheel down, you put the forks on, the forks, due to gravity, are gonna find the perfect place to sit in the correct place on those dropouts there too. If you ask virtually any pro mechanic out there, they will tend to put uh, rim brake wheels in with the bike on the ground for that wheel exactly, because they can get them exactly into the dropouts perfectly. Enjoy those lunchtime one hour rides and hopefully it solved your problem. And the final question this week comes in from Alan Coombe, who says, can you use SRAM Red ETAP with a Shimano 105 crank set? I've got the opportunity to get ETAP, but can't get the crank too. Well, yes, Alan, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, well, got the chain set, uh, and it works absolutely fine. Now, admittedly, it's not gonna give you the most perfect, crisp gear change ever, because there are some very slight uh, differences in tolerances between the two chain rings of the different brands, but it will work uh, as it will do across all 11 speed platforms there too. Right, I do hope that this week I've been able to help answer and solve your bike related problem. Like I said at the start, if you've got one, leave it for me down there in the comment section below. I love hearing all of your questions. Don't be afraid to leave them there. Also on all forms of social media using the hashtag AskGCNTech. And also remember to check out the GCN shop, shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. And don't forget to to like and share this video with your friends. And if you've not already subscribed, what is wrong with you? Make sure you do click on that little notification icon so each and every time we put a video live, you get alerted. And now for another cracking video, how about cl clicking even just down here?